All right. Hello, folks. Uh, I have a, I have some notes here that I'm going to uh, uh, read from to give you some thoughts about all this that um, won't fit that well into the slides, but I thought it was good as a preamble. Um, essentially, the the um, this is my experience in the underwater archaeology program as it developed within the NPS in the broader context of the Americas. I uh, won't <clears throat> be saying much about underwater archaeology overseas or Eurasia. A period of uh, 25 consecutive, consecutive years, I ran the uh, National Reservoir and Invasion Studies, 1975 to 80, and then, uh, as Mike said, 1980 to almost the millennium, the end of 1999, the uh, Submerged Cultural Resources Unit, which after that had its na a name changed to Submerged Resources Center and was run by Larry Murphy till 2009, and Dave Conlon has been running it uh, until now from that point. And um, together, it represents 40 uninterrupted un years since the NRIS started. There's never been a break in operations because the NRIS team was all uh, moved um, in total to the uh, Submerged Cultural Resources Unit. It was one of the reasons that we had the inundation study was to develop a permanent program in the Park Service. We thought it was necessary, we being Cal Cummings in this case, who was my um, boss and the chief of the Southwest Cultural Resources Center. Um, it, was, it was emphasized underwater resources in the parks, not the capabilities of the people. That's why it was called Submerged Cultural Resources Unit. I didn't, it wasn't maritime archaeology because we also did prehistory. And um, uh, besides, uh, we were doing shipwrecks and post-Columbus sites, but it also actually emphasized at many points um, more uh, prehistory in association with reservoirs and caves. These archaeologists were specifically adapted to the National Park Service, not just the park system, because we were emphasizing, we were um, working in the park system, obviously, and for most of the work, but we were also doing advisory work for other agencies. Um, the SRC developed directly from the inundation study that was conceived by Cal Cummings, which we'll be talking about in the body of the presentation. The NRIS team, the inundation study team, in other words, wore, began wearing Class A uniforms in the field. They had a, the only people doing it at that time in 1970, well, actually 76, so that started. Um, there's nobody in archaeology except uh, Jim Judge to a bit at, at uh, Chaco Canyon. Um, he was a fellow that always felt the good person to interact with on these kind of thoughts about where to go with this in the service. Um, all the people at the National Reservoir Inundation Study stayed in the same building, wore the same uniforms, and when they became uh, screw, uh, it had a new mission. It was focused directly in the parks. So just so you understand all those transitions, still worked into 40 uninterrupted years now, run by Dave Conlon. Um, to be honest, when I started, cultural resources was not a, was not a, well, actually it just become a term about two years later. And when it came into existence, it, um, many park managers in the 70s were actually Reluctant, they were kind of annoyed about having another thing to work to worry about. More cultural resources responsibility, and frankly, so were most archaeological center managers. Big issue uh, with 
American archaeology on, uh, about what we were doing had to do with shipwrecks. They were seen as too young. Remember, no one had done uh, anthropologically oriented shipwreck work by this time. There was work going on by George Bass in the uh, Mediterranean, but uh, he was very different orientation. I won't go into the, uh, the philosophical differences about just that, about the nature of the archaeology we're doing. Um, to give an idea, it was a reasonable question, but both Pete Faust and Keith Anderson, who were then heads of archaeological centers, asked me at different times the question that was bothering them about shipwrecks. I said, look, there's, uh, there's no stratigraphy on shipwrecks. And uh, Pete said, how do you get the diachronic dimension to change? Well, and I said, that's actually its strength, an uncommon a con uncontaminated slice of the past you could compare with other similar sli slices. Plus you had a terminus and plan for all the artifacts. This wasn't um, uh, something that burst out of my head. I, uh, did, I did a lot of thinking about it in red to put that together, but I was ready for the question because I knew it was bothering me. Uh, Larry Murphy, Tony Carroll, and I were long bothered by this issue. We knew the submerged cultural resources unit was going to be a real, it'd be really setting face in a headwind if uh, this issue existed with uh, archaeologists' reluctance to buy uh, anything that had to do with shipwrecks. Uh, we had a long talk about this, and I, and I drove down a couple of miles to see Doug Schwartz, who was then the president of the School of American Research. And when I laid out what we wanted to do, I was wanted to suggest a seminar that would bring this to, the, to focus in the uh, general anthropological-oriented uh, American archaeological community. And that uh, he said right off the bat, Gee, I thought you were going to talk about, you know, just showing, just have a program on all the snappy slides and stuff. And... He was surprised. I said, no, we want to have people like Patty Jo Watson, Mark Leone, uh, who were heads, who, who were theatricians really recognized at the time. I don't I imagine still. And then people actually did it, uh, like Sonny Cockrell, George Bass, Larry Murphy, myself. Uh, Keith McElroy was going to come, but he died in a diving accident before we get him here. He knew, um, but, and Doug Schwartz had an idea right away. This whole process, by the way, took 15 minutes and all the money for the seminar was available. Uh, he said, well, I know this guy at the University of Hawaii named Dick Gould. He's chair there, or, or later he was chair at uh, Brown. But at this time he was there, and he hadn't really been doing underwater, but stuff that, that uh, Doug thought was real appropriate. All of that resulted in the publication of Shipwreck Anthropology in 1983. That was our opening shot as, as far as trying to deal with that problem uh, with the American archaeological community. It wasn't so much a problem in Europe. But the real source of support, support we had at first came from Jack Moorhead, Bill. It came from superintendents. We're often smart people, and they're often also divers. They came personally to diving workshops we had run during the inundation study in the 70s. And the, uh, these are the people who really provided the backing for the development of a unfunded permanent park service program that dealt with underwater archaeology. My guide, and this is the last comment I'll make as an early point in this, my guide for archaeological ethics and procedures really was turned on, came alive at the American Society for Conservation Archaeology meetings, ASCA, in um, 1974. Cal Cummings, you know, they were in Denver. Cal Cummings took me to the meeting, and I met Doug Scoville and others in the NPS CRM world. 
this um, new concept of cultural resources fit well between agencies like the Park Service and this emerging group, uh, ASCA. Bill Light, judge back then, affected my worldview in archaeology. And the last comment was I went away with the thought that, if anything, the biggest problem in um, having a program that could really serve and not be tied up all the time with a follow through uh, past a reasonable level was to keep excavation out of it. And this is not new, it's very much a position of ASCA. And um, I bought into it and still do. Uh, <clears throat> the only time this team has been seriously involved in excavation that I can immediately recall is the Hundley. And um, working with the Navy on that screw, and then uh, SRC divers took part in that ex excavation. They were actually probably the major component in it in removing the, the Hundley. And the, the reason that I signed off early on that was we were going to have nothing to do with the preservation and taking care of it. I thought that's a program killer. I mean, if you weren't in preservation or the <clears throat> professionally taking care of stuff. Remember, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we were hit, the Park Service was hit, with having to care for something like three or four million artifacts sometime, uh, I might be wrong, but in the 90s as a result of the uh, a lot of excavations in the river valleys and stuff. And we're trying to be fast enough to document things, find the essence of sites, map them, photograph them, bring the information up to archaeologists and, importantly, to park managers. OK, that, and that's essentially, I wanted to use that as a preamble. And I'm ready to talk about the slides. Uh, Mike, you know my great abilities with computers. I hit uh, okay, content. Hit con All right. Uh, I'm just going to start with Yellowstone, in the heart of the earliest Park Service uh, thinking. And okay, let me. Okay, there we go. Just a few slides are there. That right there, by the way, would not be a good place to dive. Um, and going to Isle Royal, which is one of the first parks that we did some serious underwater work in. And that was in 1980 we started. And it was no accident, I think, that Jack Moorhead was the superintendent. He had been a very um, important f f person in helping develop the team, develop the team. OK, this is just an idea that even in uh, classic parks like that, you have things like this, the like shipwrecks. Uh, in terms of natural resources, you've got these vents. Thing. A lot of what you see in the surface is also emerging in a lake that is bigger than Biscayne National Monument before it became a park. It's a, it's a big lake, something 125 square miles. 8,000 feet altitude, which makes the diving a little bit compli complicated because of physiological issues. It's Jim Bradford here back then. Um, well, this is actually him working at uh, Yellowstone. Some of the smaller things that we found at Yellowstone Lake. And a lot of associated work with this using GIS and um, uh, survey in the, in, the, in the water for both natural and cultural imagery was, uh, that part of it was run by Larry Murphy and was going on in a, in a different place. I don't have images of that. Glacier, same sort of thing. Uh, this image from Glacier is one that has kind of gotten into the archaeology the diving community as uh, a kind of an interesting, so I think it's Lake McDonald, 
were some tools that fell through the ice that maintenance left there, and they didn't land like this in the lake, but uh, more reasonably with uh, weight down and all of it. Anyway, divers went here over the years, and it became kind of a thing in the diving community to move these around and put them up in different uh, positions. I thought that was a kind of interesting visitor participation in park diving resources. And you see these appear over the years in uh, diving magazines. Jenny Lake was something that crossed the bounds of natural and cultural issues. This is a little bit later shot than what I was there with Gary Davis in 1983. They were concerned that uh, the upright trees at Jenny Lake in the water might have been planted trees and interest and had come from a shift, a uh, seismic shift, and which worried a lot of people because it wasn't that far from Jackson Dam. Now, we examined these, and particularly the um, uh, the root balls, and this one here is laying down without anything caught up in it. But the majority of trees that were up, or actually all the trees that were upright, and there was a fair number, uh, had root balls full of rocks. And there was a down to up ratio of something like 31 to 1 of the down trees. Uh, Gary Davis, who I was with, um, and I uh, concluded that they were not, it didn't indicate that there was seismic shift here. We explained why and left that for consideration by the managers. And they were pretty happy with the information. This is one of the place, first places we worked in Sile Royal. The pictures are more modern. This, are you seeing this, my cursor? Yeah, we can see your, we can see your cursor. I'm sorry, I, it's probably distracting. Uh, the, uh, these images are of the type of shipwrecks you find in Isle Royale. The one on the left, again, with uh, this is SRC, newer Dyra's um, equipment, which is a lot more modern than what we were using back then. But you see the nature of the ships. This is the Chisholm. Uh, it's this wooden vessel, and uh, the 1800s, I don't know, it was probably uh, uh, that in the Cumberland or late 1800s. This one here is an upright vessel in the water. We're documenting essentially industrial age in the Great Lakes, and it, it brought to light to the Park Service as much as anyone else the, what a really fascinating uh, aspect of the the age was down here underwater. And this engine right here, compound steam engine, I've seen these the attempts to preserve these that were removed from the water. This one is probably in better shape than any of that I've seen because water, of water preservation. This is Glen Lyon, another one of the sites. And a couple more just to give you the sense of what our oil was like. This book on the left was a study. It's about 500-something page. Uh, uh, part of the series of submerged cultural resources studies we did, which have 19 of them uh, on different parks. Uh, and on the right, the diving community was very interested in, in what we were doing with this. And they asked, this, and uh, this publisher wanted to do a uh, Public, I mean, a, a version that would be easily, um, that could be sold to sport divers. And we talked to the park, and took out a couple of chapters which we thought were information more appropriate, and gave it to them, and they did that. This happens fairly often with some of the um, publications we have. Then you've got uh, reservoirs. This is in Glen Canyon. This, these were taken during the inundation study. You can see the nature of sites that you're finding down there. Also, that high-tech uh, mug board there was uh, probably not the best, but we had at the time. Uh, 
this is a site um, from, well, what we used to call probably Anasazi, which is not such a good term anymore, uh, ancestral Pueblo. And back, uh, that's are found quite a few places underwater in that lake, in a reservoir, uh, pictographs. Uh, downstream from the dam, Glen Canyon Dam, this is a, these Navajos were fishing on the bowl, on the boiler here of a um, Charles H. Spencer steamboat that had an interesting story behind it. And that was uh, documented and we did a publication on it. Uh, and this, this has Tony Carroll, I think Jim Bradford might have also contributed to that publication. Then is the, the whole issue of dams and what they are, what they do. And in terms of the uh, modern times, there's a lot of real questions about it, but we were interested in what happened to artifacts. The river valleys are where are they were, were how humans first spread through the Americas, you know, going down the coast perhaps and following where rivers ended into the sea, and they're the most sensitive areas you can have for cultural resources. People follow water, and that's where reservoirs collect the water. And it makes for an awful lot of our past underwater. During, now, we learned during the 70s uh, that the Park Service had the first civilian underwater dive capabilities in the nation the, uh, for a federal uh, um, program. And we built a strong kind of association with them and taught, during the inundation study, taught a lot of rangers how to apply what they were primarily concerned with to the underwater and um, well, in this case, they're putting down maintenance um, pouring cement underwater to secure buoys. But we did a lot, we worked with them a lot on diving, on uh, recoveries, on body recoveries, and taught them a lot of techniques, which was just to increase our bond with the parks. It was amazingly successful in getting uh, park background probably more than all the large reports we did. Just uh, some of the things you run into. This is at Lake Mead uh, when the water backs away from uh, River Valley. The St. Thomas that was. Uh, this uh, aggregate sorting facility in Lake Mead that was built for doing a dam. It's now underwater. And these are the kind of pl uh, places that National Reservoir Inundation Study are was focused at, uh, as it came, at, and this is what started the screw team ultimately. These are the, end of the agencies that funded the inundation study. They came up with, for a four-year program, they came up with a little over a million dollars. And in 1975, that was a lot of money. Then that was Carol Cummings and, um, I have to emphasize his idea, one that I was slow to accept, and then I went around with him selling it for a year to the agencies. Okay, this is stuff we've talked about. The Some of these sites that were going underwater and we set up for inundation before the water got there for our studies. So, Sandy Rail on the, on the left is one of our archaeologists talking to um, you know, either a core or bureau manager here uh, on before we started the, the diving operations, which went on here. And if you had to show this, this is Cal Cummings. Lower left is Dick Leverty with the Corps of Engineers. Uh, he was the head of the environmental program. Jeez, I just forgot the head of the Bureau of Reclamations program, uh, PhD archaeologist. His name just slipped out of my head. I'm sorry. Anyway, they're signing here the uh, 
the, you know, the, the money away, essentially, and it ended up being a good program that they were happy with. This preliminary report of the study came out in 77 and identified a whole series of hypothetical deductive issues. I mean, that, and with uh, test parameters and all of that, that would determine what happened to archaeology in the water. This is a two-volume uh, two final report, and it's, uh, it's around, it's close to 1,400 pages, this thing, and it gave the results. Essentially, this is how we recommend archaeologists deal with reservoirs, and this is because this is, we weren't trying to tell them how to do their research design, except that when they were dealing with the material culture, this was the best guess at what would happen to it. And the reason that that was so important is that these agencies had gotten their, their backs up very understandably before the inundation study because they would get proposals that start out with 10 sites, this, this, and this, are going to be flooded, they're going to be lost forever. And another guy would send something in and say, because of those the inundation, they were all going to be saved forever. So they caught a little difference in that, and that is a lot of what, in a simple way, triggered the study. Dan, Dan so the part, part of the study was experimental in the sense that you would set up experiments before sites were inundated and then test their... Is that correct? You would test yes. out the results of the water? That's what you were showing before with that one site, terrestrial site. Yes, uh, a lot of it, uh, that's correct. You know, for instance, we would go into sites and uh, that had, were being studied. And in some cases, we made our own sites that had uh, controlled artifacts we had studied beforehand, put them in there because we knew that they were going to soon be inundated, you know, within months. And then would go back underwater after a couple of years, take them out and document what had happened to them, and then also go to sites that were underwater and it, it, for a long period of time and um, exam examine what kind of physical processes that affect them, either chemical or movement around the bottom, etc. Fascinating, yeah. Now, this is. Sammy C that was working for SRC. This is only about I don't know in the last ten years, but um, and it's in Lake Mead, I believe. This is uh, the reason I put this here was to show that the issue just wasn't how the artifacts deteriorated, but if can you imagine anything but a large honest well I keep saying Anasazi site. That if you had, let's say, uh, hunting camps or ceramic um, district scatters, that they might not be heard at all, but you are never in the rest of time going to find them. They are, you cannot survey this area and under this find a lot of the less dramatic sites that are important to the archaeological record. Uh, this is just a few more uh, sites of bit, um, shots of recent uh, material material culture down in the reservoirs, and uh, more recent S SOC divers uh, under Dave Conlon here. It's a B29 that's sunk in Lake Mead, and they've done a lot of work on this. You can imagine this is in the cockpit. This is also in about 190 feet of water. Oh, it was. Now it's in about, I, he can correct me, about 120 feet of water or something, as the drought takes effect. And there was a issue that came up. You see that, well, here's the map they did, but quagga mussels started invading during the project. So that is the same item as this. Same propeller. Um, tail fitting on the side. Now it's like this. Uh, a lot of things that were above water, of course, this is down Lake Mojave, 
this uh, transported vehicles on that, um, not sure what you'd call it, but that is now down about 90 feet of water. But the, it's following the history down, and it doesn't get out of the purview of the Park Service just because it goes into water. Ranch house in Amistad before, the, before it was flooded. And we're looking out at one of the early screwdrivers at the entrance to the... Well, I'm inside the... One of us is inside the ranch house taking a picture of him outside. Now, if you just look at the visibility in the water, it's not great. And uh, in another place, it was a lot worse than that. But if you went down further, 200, I mean, 120 feet, you find this spring, this cave coming up that has water that goes from three feet visibility to about a you know 150 foot visibility in a matter of uh, three three feet of change. This is a spring coming up in the lake. This is Montezuma Well, and this is the first place actually that was worked by Park Service archaeologists George Fisher. This is Marion Riggs. This is um, Cal Cummings, Roberto Constalis, who was from the park. Um, I was a guest editor last month on a natural history article. I mean, not natural history, um, what do you call it, issue. And this woman is still around, fascinating person, and there's an article about her in there. I should mention that the inundation study itself, which is very unusual at the time, had half of it was there were uh, three women out of usually six archaeologists. And they were trained to the, even though some of them had small frames to the condition, that in 1976, I'm sorry, this goes back to the study for a minute. This is them climbing out of uh Montezuma well, uh, you've got to be in good shape to do that. This is, again, 76. Now, you see the difference. I said, we really have to get back here. It's a fascinating place. And we did, 30 years later. Dave Conlon has got a slightly different apparatus on here. And these are fantastic systems. They're introduced by when Ryan Murphy was chief. And uh, Dave and Brett Seymour, who is the deputy chief, fantastic photographer, a lot of these images of his, um, have been using them, giving them capabilities that no one else who are doing either federal or academic archaeology uh, have. They can do, I won't go into details for people who aren't interested in um, diving apparatus, but that's the case. It is the craziest place underwater I've ever seen. Yes, it has archaeology, and it had uh, structures and then it's like a salado around the uh, around the rim. But this is what has fascinated me. I spent a lot of my years of my life studying sinkholes and caves. Never seen anything like this. These um, pools of fluidized sand that are moving, uh, going in circles, bubbling. Uh, Dave's here dropping a uh, probe down into this to that pool, and it went down a hundred over a hundred feet. This is 55 deep where the bottom is, and it goes another hundred feet deeper. Uh, it shows it from the um, plyometric view, and this is what they're doing from the side view. Hot water probably coming in. This is warmer than the water above. It's spinning. All this energy is carrying the water to the top. That is unique to the cave diving community, which I contacted over this. And anyway, Montezuma well. The earliest look we did at cost was the first year I was in Santa Fe before the inundation study started. Larry Murphy is a uh, also, a highly trained diver was coming through the area. So this is Buffalo River in Arkansas. Went into this Indian rock shelter, they call it. 
and found that the it petered out the cave system inside pretty close. Um, other karst areas, and these are tremendous areas for archaeology in Chichen Itza is where American underwater archaeology started. All right, well, archaeology in the Americas started. Uh, 1904 is some of or essentially what this sinkhole is. This is Ozark National Scenic Riverway. Moving to more, to more uh, classic or known sites underwater archaeology is Tortugas. Uh, a lot of these again, but see more. Just to give you a sense of what the environment's like, you all know shipwrecks, and but this is just to get a feel for what they're like down there. The kind of thing that early on, this Larry Nordby did this, another Park Service archaeologist. The uh, I should emphasize that Larry Nordby, Jerry Livingston who was the illustrator actually as far back as the Bertrand Project. And Jim Bradford became the adjunct members of SRC uh, and worked there essentially. They, they, since 1980, for example, uh, Larry Nordby and Livingston started earlier, but they, and they went on for about 20 years working part of each year with us. Uh, Jim Bradford's done it for 33 years or something now. And it, and without them, we simply couldn't have done a lot of what we did. Point Reyes, this is a Pacific kind of environment. Channel Islands is here. It gives you, this kind of gives a feeling for what the parks look like underwater. This is in Alaska, in Wrangell St. Elias. Uh, I was set up here in the early 80s to document what that thing was. And it's, it happens to be a guano carrier from 1907 Japanese. But um, this is, uh, again, an example of the kind of places that a submerged cultural resource unit worked even when it wasn't submerged. We had a lot of attention paid to the Arizona, which was a major important site for us and to the American people. Um, the most information that existed when I first got together with Gary Cummins, the superintendent who wanted the work done, was this photo where we could see this much of the ship. Essentially, there was nothing else. Um, so what was down there? And Gary insisted on knowing, and and sixty and uh, seventy, uh, forgetting that seventy two. I went here on my honeymoon and uh, snorkeled around, and we came back and began working. This is the uh, the oil that's in the water around the Arizona, and this is a general feel for what it looks like underwater. These and remember, these pictures are taken in water very low visibility. It took a long time, but to get this, it's not easy to set something like that up. And we have in the uh, we introduced ROVs in the eighty in the late eighties to this site. And this is just like personal things, tile in the galley area. Um, some of the work that particularly Larry, Matt Russell, Dave Conner were doing on uh, the, the ship chemistry and um, you know, probing it here with sonic probes. And this is taking samples of oil. This is kind of a peek inside, you know, the you know, desk here. There's a phone next to it, dial phone. Um, this was for... CBS broadcast. We did about 20 nationwide uh, films, uh, at least since the beginning of Screw. We put them with a lot of documentary groups to some views of the Arizona. And a study coming up that SRC is doing, where they're going to 
uh, not go, not put people in which we won't do because of the. Uh, it's just a matter of respect to this being a tomb. But they cleared with the survivors that it was okay. We we need to find out what's going on with uh, oil in this thing and uh, corrosion. And the studies they did are advanced by putting these inside. And we said, look, if you go inside and look for the, mainly we're interested in following oil around the overhead ceiling and uh, looking at measuring corrosion. They had probes. They could poke the metal and all. So they said, fine, do it. And uh, they did it. And they're doing it in a, it's going to be a, a more major extent coming up that uh, Dave and Brett have planned for, I think, this year. This is the um, first shots of Pearl Harbor. Remember, we think at 8 o'clock the planes come, 8.10 the uh, Arizona gets hit. Well, an hour earlier, a Japanese sub uh, entered the perimeter, the, the like a defensive area of Pearl Harbor, and was sunk by a destroyer, the destroyer Ward, and that's been looked for for decades. And I had made friends with a fellow from the University of Hawaii lab research labs in 1986 or something. We had started the, the research in '83, and we had uh, fooled around trying to get access to the uh, expensive submersibles that would find that sub, but even though there was no project funded to find it because it cost a fortune, he found it and immediately held off diving until he invited us back. Myself and Larry Murphy went down in this submersible uh, to see this sub. It's in a thousand feet of water. And that was the, the first, the, these drawings were, were the files are by Jerry Livingston. Uh, these came from techniques we put together for a few years on the uh, the, the Owl Royal shipwrecks, involved very very simple techniques that were also shrewd by God. And they, we laid a, uh, something like a quarter to a half mile line cave diving line around this ship in straight lines and worked with high school geometry and to uh, come out with these drawings and we also made an association with the Navy who helped us on many projects. These are the type of some things in the deck of Arizona. This was made from our drawings in um, well this is when Bill Dickinson was superintendent and uh, he had wanted us to do a lot more of the work, the chemical work and uh, uh, corrosion work on the site, but also uh, wanted to to redo the, this this view you saw on the drawings, which Larry Nordby did to go into this model, which is eight feet long. Real hit out at the site, out at the memorial. This came out in '89. I mean, yeah, '89. Uh, it just put all the work together, including on the U.S. Utah, which we had, uh, was a national historic landmark, and became real popular out there. We, apparently, 40,000 copies sold. I'm not sure of the figure, but I think it's at least that. If you ask why it's such a big issue in Arizona, what's the problem with getting the oil out? But there might be a half million gallons in there. And they aren't in a big tank that you can go into and put the hose into. They're spread over at least a hundred of uh, these bulk. Um, I just forgot the name of these things, sir. The oil tank, the, the, uh, the oil containers uh, fell out of my head just then. Um, just then we, we helped them by putting together interpretive exhibits, stuff in magazines, and we've built the visibility of a lot of sites. Guam, Stel Newman was uh, the superintendent back when we first went there and died in the wreck the next year in, in um, 
Jim Machelka ranger there who worked with us. These are the invasion beaches of Guam. There's a lot on them. Talafofo Bay. There's a wreck down here. We documented that for them. But the parks had a lot of stuff in it. And also areas that weren't in the parks were worth taking a well, whether it worth it or not, we were asked to do it, was to go back on these wrecks that were blasted in 1946. This would have been the the fourth and fifth atomic explosions. Uh, yes, they had Trinity, the, um, the two, uh, and Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And then in 1946, you had two blasts at Bikini Atoll. And they put some large vessels on the bottom. This is uh, Murphy on the, the Nagato flag. This is where the flagship of the Japanese Navy when um, where Yamamoto was back in the Sea of Japan when the attack in Pearl Harbor took place. It's upside down here. This is a submarine. This is 180 feet of water. And we're all using air. So the training of these divers, which we emphasize so strongly, really comes into, uh, it's really important in situations like this. It's Jerry Livingston, our, uh, one of our illustrators that was working on that site, pilot fish submarine. This is on the USS Saratoga aircraft carrier. Uh, also in the Saratoga, this is uh, a light bulb in the hangar deck. This went this is four hundred yards from an atomic blast the size it took out Hiroshima. And that light bulb, I always wanted to get it and uh and start a company making these light bulbs. I thought it's pretty impressive. Um, hell diver planes, cockpits uh, in the deck of Saratoga. Larry Nordby was the one who did the finalized drawings of Saratoga, which are fantastic. This is a huge piece of paper. Well, these, uh, it's like eight feet. And that's what we brought back. Our associates in a program called Project Seamark with the Navy, which I don't really talk about in here because it's just too much, and uh, went on for 10 years. And they gave us tremendous support. We had them go in ahead of us, and the Navy divers put buoys on these, which took, would have taken up a couple of weeks of our time, these these sites. And they would do that in just the time we asked them for places. Uh, that's the Saratoga again. You see on the plyometric view here. We're part of lagoon. This is from here to here is 900 feet, 890 feet. Uh, long ways. Big ship. Yeah, and you mean, we did this. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mean they put buoys on the, sh uh, the ships in order to identify the locations ahead of time? Yeah, you see, we knew they were in a, like a square mile of water. but And uh, they weren't like... Uh, they could uh, had to find all of them and put good uh, buoys for us to hook up to in the bow and at the stern. And that permitted us to save a lot of time. Doing that kind of setup work is really uh, uh, spends a lot of time. And the uh, that as soon as we got there, we could go right out. We had a plan of what to do, go down and take on a ship like that. Uh, it's Larry Nordby's drawing on this. wasn't anything he could do in normal human hours. This guy stayed up all night doing this stuff uh, month after month. This is the now, this particular publication, uh, the people, I ran this project, Larry Murphy was the, um, the deputy, but we had a real good, a lot of help here, because we had uh, Larry Norby, Jim, uh, uh, Jerry Livingston, and the fifth one for both years that we went back, 89 and 90, uh, was Jim Delgado, and he was the editor of this. He... Uh, Larry Murphy and I wrote this. And he did a great job with it and got it out by 90, uh, 91. We were there 18, 89 and 90, and he got the support done. It was very important for the Bikinian people who needed this in their court actions 
with the United States government, and um, it was important to ICOMOS, which I was a member of for uh, like 13 years. And anyway, uh, this is an important site for a lot of reasons, and it's now a, a national store, uh, international. What do you call them? Um, heritage site. This is something Jim wrote. Uh, it's a, just a personal book he did on that fleet. I think it's not bad. This underwater art wonders of the national parks was something we put together in association with the National Park Foundation. Well, they paid for it because that's what it means. And uh, it's by John Brooks and I. And um, he did the uh, photography for it. And it essentially reaches out to divers and tells them what they can and can't do, but how to enjoy national parks underwater. It got some awards, uh, by the way. It was a good book. This is just a reminder of what they're doing now in SRC. They have a tremendous capabilities for diving with these rebreather systems that said introduced in the 2000s by Larry, and then Dave has carried them on aggressively and has them as this is what the SRC uses all the time. And they have give Park Service divers, the only ones who have these are in the Park Service. They use them regularly underwater. And uh, let's say it extends their time and capabilities in a terrific manner. This thing is a popular, you mentioned this before, and I could hear because, I just want to mention this is a popular publication. I wrote it for a popular audience. So if you're looking for a lot of um, uh, details or on uh, uh, research design or something, they're not going to find it there. But it discusses something I wrote to, wrote to discuss the history of the team. I think that's the way. Yeah, that's a, that's it. I can take any thoughts or questions you have. All right. Okay, folks, we're going to open up for questions. Uh, turn on your mics if you have a question, then please turn it off afterwards. Um, Dan, I'll start with a question. It's okay. Um, I read where somewhere about sort of a, um, the relationship between agency park service work and sport diving and looters as being kind of like an arms race in terms of the adoption of technology, uh, something that, that happened pretty rapidly in the mid-'70s. Can you talk about that, the adoption of technology? Uh, yeah, about keeping up and... and um, how much technology you had to innovate upon in order to do your mission? It was something we thought about all the time, and um, we. I, one of the first things we did was, uh, and I, I don't want to say get too technical on this, but the uh, we solved the problem. Uh, Larry Murphy had uh, in his program and. War Mineral Springs with Sonny Cockrell had uh, determined uh, well, we wanted to substitute oxygen to go to do this work in the park. This is this is before the study even the even before the inundation study, and we're concerned about having long time park operations, a lot of people diving with different physiologies. Uh, at altitude, because a lot of parks are at altitude. And we had a system that we took from the cave diving community, which used oxygen on decompression. And we worked for a couple of years getting permission from the top physiologists in the country who to back us when we decided in the program to directly use oxygen to 30 feet deep on decompression. That was one of the first. And then we modified equipment to where there was uh, one of the uh, myths that had been developed in the diving community was that they had all the that they were so far ahead of what the bunch of feds could do, or and I would say that uh, that wasn't the case. We kept up with them, and really we uh, were quite a bit ahead of them as uh, as we went along the program. 
this program was not going light on diving. The uh, if you do in the National Park Service and a federal agency working with outside peoples, and in some sense establishing that these parks are guarded by the national park system and we didn't just fall out of the tree yesterday when it comes to diving technology it helps in the preservation that's what the superintendents and the rangers tell us and they're very pleased with that and that's the best i can answer that question Dan, this is Dave Conlon. I have a question for you. It, when you were putting together your dive team um, back in the day, did you get a lot of pushback from like upper senior management and stuff saying that this was too risky of an endeavor, this was something that was um, we didn't want Park Service employees doing and it would be better left to specialists from outside? Yeah, one of the things... Uh, was that we had, as a matter of fact, when Ray, this actually came after the inundation study was when uh, Reagan was in and I want to say a little, <laughs> the deputy director, oh, Mary Lou Greer had actually tried to end the program, but it wasn't because it was, uh, she thought it should be in the private sector, that the uh, uh, and made a very strong effort to end it and received a lot of uh, resistance from Park Service managers. Mainly it was from, uh, let's say, Jack, Jack Moore, but it was uh, Bob Kerr, the regional director in uh, Southwest, and later John Cook. and then later. So uh, essentially the, the people that became the greatest defended this program because it also used money from the Park Service budget and that sort of thing. It ended up being park superintendents and um, regional directors. It came to a lot from operations because they, they thought they were getting a lot of benefits from it. And from Doug Scoville, who was a great supporter in the Washington Mill, he's a chief anthropologist. And at times, from the archaeologists, often when we went to the individual regions, we had a lot of good help from specific uh, regional archaeologists. But you have to understand that they were also, particularly in the later years, competing for some of the money when it went to the, um, what was it, the survey initiative, um, sorry, SAP. The, uh, SAP, SAP, yeah. And that became a, you know, an issue. And we, uh, you know, people uh, had their own, uh, kind of uh, flocks to, to keep, you know, to, had their own issues. And even though that was really put together, the proposal, and that was put together by Cal Cummings, and the, um, and, Scoville was a big supporter of it. The fact that 10% went to the uh, Submerged Resources Center was a, uh, an issue with a lot of people, and understandable, but not one we would understand that much. We needed that to do the surveys to uh, do the work we did and, and eventually prevail on it. And were you ever involved in um, investigating uh, for the prosecution of any ARPA cases? I'm curious. I feel like yeah, that would be a the, special. Uh, right. There was um, uh, but the bust, the, the, the law enforcement action that Channel Islands did with the Marine Sanctuary Program and the park uh, was the most major one for artifacts, as far as I know, in the New World. Uh, and involved a lot of good law enforcement work. Um, that, uh, well, Larry Murphy, for instance, was testified uh, in the court actions, and this uh, was a beautifully put together operation 
been arrested in uh, something like 19 people, very high fines, boats confiscated, and it was uh, also highly, uh, people were very displeased with it who were in the diving community who thought was too heavy a hand. Well, it wasn't. These people were out like outright lying uh, to the parks, getting permits to go in them, swearing they weren't going to touch anything, and the Park Service knew they were. And they uh, set something up where agents from park rangers came in on a transfer. I, should, I don't know if I should say who they were, and they... Uh, uh, were in a in the actually in the boat the uh, salvage boat that went out to I mean the uh, the park the, the private dive boat company had sent out a large number of divers and overnight dives and they didn't know that they had two undercover park rangers on board a married couple or a man and woman and um, when they got back to the to shore they were all rangers and sheriffs and federal agents were waiting for them, and they were all arrested. And it went to a high-profile court action. This is in the 90s. And, and I do, was ARPA directly involved? Some, uh, I don't remember, I'm sorry, uh, that it was, if that was a part of it, or if it was marine sanctuary violations uh, specifically. Any other thoughts from someone who hasn't spoken there? Or questions? Dan, could you talk a little bit about, um, I was interested in the Shipwreck Anthropology book and the interactions with academia. And wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your interactions or your experience in interactions between the Park Service and the academic world in the context of, of underwater archaeology, you know, the, like the last uh, SHAs I was, I was at were just uh, um, packed with National Park Service representation, partly because it's centennial, but also because there's great research going on in the park. So um, have you always seen a lot of interaction between um, academic worlds? Yeah, it, we had a lot of it, particularly after the inundation study came out. And then it was followed a couple or two years later by shipwreck anthropology, and we had a great deal of interaction of interaction with the academic community, um, which there were a um, fair amount of papers written that you know I was involved with, or Tony or Larry, uh, and um, so many SH first SHA oriented uh, materials and sometimes with uh, prehistoric sites. Actually, we found some of the most interest in, in the uh, people who were, some of the people most affected by this were in, Eura were, were in Europe and Australia. And while I was in uh, Ecomos, the uh, on the International Committee on Underwater Cultural Heritage for about 13 years, uh, it, it played a big role. These were, all, these were all private academic people involved in it mainly, except for like Parks Canada, who had, uh, has a very good team. And, uh, they had Robert Grenier and, the, in my association, in my association with it, there was a lot of interest. In fact, uh, there was, there's a lot written in journals about how the shipwreck anthropology and some of the stuff we had done before affected the Australian program. If you know how that works with uh, maritime archaeology, how they do it with about 17 million people there, I don't know, but they have a huge um, underwater archaeological community in Australia. And they were some of the most uh, deeply interested, and, and also the British and um, Canadians. And in the, in the U.S., it seemed like there was a lot. Um, 
but I think that came most from people who are directly involved with the projects. And I don't know as much, for instance, how the SAA community uh, reacted as a whole. I didn't attend as much as of the, their sessions. Questions from the audience? Yeah. I've got some kind of early career questions for you, Dan. Um, can, can you tell me a bit about your early career options when you were um, looking for jobs as, a, as, a, as an archaeologist? Uh, well, did you contemplate entering academia or CRM or agency work, and what made you make the choice to to join? I wasn't even I wasn't even sure I wanted to be in the Park Service until after I had a direct experience with in Southeast. But mainly, I, I still wasn't uh, it. It wasn't appealing to me as much as I thought until I really started interacting with Cal Cummings in uh, 1974 through the beginning of the funding and the inundation study in 76. And that uh, is what really convinced me this is what we wanted to do. And it wasn't because it was the only possible way to do it, but the thing that would please me was to, uh, I suppose it was the Park Service context. I was a lot. I was very interested in preserving these resources in the in the Park Service context, and I thought we were finding a way to do it. Uh, I was more interested in that than being only an academic uh, environment. I, I I respect the environment, the academic environment. We contributed to it quite a bit, but my what drives my soul isn't. Uh, uh, it's the parks, and the, that we can, we get the privilege of doing this work in the park environment, and we look out for the parks. That I think we raise the consciousness of submerged resources during those years. The fact that it stayed for forty years, as you're seeing now, is an indication that it just didn't hit a blank wall. Uh, there were other people doing it. There is, uh, to some degree, they're doing it in Southeast. I wasn't as familiar with what they did and didn't pay that much attention to it, but it was, uh, those folks were also doing stuff there. The, uh, this was needed. It was a point in time that the Park Service adopt this kind of a program, and it did or it wouldn't be here. And then uh, could you talk a little bit about some of your early mentors, either in school before your Park Service time, uh, in, in the discipline of archaeology? And then you've mentioned a few of the really important figures, but um, just kind of to give us a feel for um, that generation of service leadership. Well, remember that in the, the Park Service archaeologists had pretty much, until shipwreck anthropology, uh, I think ignored to their peril for the archaeological um, resource shipwrecks, but that wasn't the, um, the the things that immediately turned me on. I think that some of the first publications that came out, for instance, uh, Stan Olson, who was at Florida State. Yeah, I've got a. Uh, <laughs> a picture from the first article he did in Natural History in 1958 on work at Wakoa Springs that uh, sitting in my wall over here, he gave it to me back at the university. He had a lot of, uh, it all affected me. I was primarily doing anthropology and I took um, some courses in archaeology and some from him and zooarchaeology, domestic animals. And the connection that he seemed to be showing the value of what was down there 
in the stuff he wrote as well as anyone I had seen up to that point. You know, you had, in the 1960s, George Bass was doing um, very professional, excellent work in the Mediterranean. He wasn't doing it in the New World. He, he was then an associate at University of Pennsylvania, now um, Texas A&M. And they have, they have a good program. But the uh, at his time, uh, uh, the... How do I put it? He um, did not have any interest in, for instance, going to a shipwreck, sampling it, documenting it, and then moving on and uh, finding out what the resource base was before he dug it. He very specifically would argue intensely. I've sat on the bus with him, and we've argued about this for like eight hours straight, about um, you've got to take all the artifacts out, uh, examine every one of them, and write a and publish them. Uh, I mean, publish on them, even if it takes you 30 years. And I thought it was ridiculous. You know, like why would you spend that kind of time on one side? It didn't mean that. Now, let me jump in to say that I don't mean to say that. He didn't do very good work. He did. And it was um, just it was contrary to like what I had learned and was turned on from by the American Society for Conservation Archaeology, the Park Service, and Cal Cummings in my first associations, early on associations with the Park Service. That's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to spend my life looking at busted glass from a shipwreck. Uh, and deciding that that was the most important thing and that uh, mattered to me. It wasn't. It wasn't going to be. And that's simply, you know, and before that, um, I simply came out of a community which was an activist community. I was involved with, I, uh, you know, it's a thing I mentioned to you. I was involved in Greensboro uh, uh, sitting activity. He was arrested in that, kicked out of school, and went to uh, organize for labor unions and for textile workers. And I had, you know, um, and when I went to, uh, you know, to the university, I was because I was interested in underwater things and I was interested in anthropology. Anthropology essentially turned me on more than a lot of the archaeology at first. I was interested in social anthropology. And then um, through when we started work, uh, moved it over to archaeology. Okay, actually, that's a good um, seek to my next question. So, um, let's see. Do you feel like broad changes in national politics and social trends over the course of your career affected your your job in the Park Service or the organization of the Park Service? Can you mention any... Big, I mean, we're about to possibly see a big presidential election and a big change in administration. Are there other like watershed moments in national social history that affected the Park Service well, and trickled down to your job? Well, I, mean, I think that uh, there grew within the Park Service itself a sense of identity, identity with cultural resources that it didn't have before the, um, the the early 70s and started to build. In other words, the, if you were to talk to park superintendents, they saw themselves more as natural resources managers. And this wasn't absolutely you know, the case. You had Mesa Verde and a lot of places that had archaeological resources, but the Park Service as a um, entity uh, didn't seem to identify as much with uh, cultural resources. I think for the submerged resources that I had most experience with, direct experience, the the fact that we tied it so specifically to park operations and their diving program and the other things they did made it seem important to the parks. To uh, And those people were actually more important to us than just about anyone else. 
they take care of the resources. If we can't convince them to doing something uh, that works, then we shouldn't be doing it. I want uh, the archaeological archaeological um, theory and methodology. If you're not doing it right, it will catch up to you very quickly. And that community should be judging and interacting all the time with the internal, you know, with what we do. And we should be interacting with them. Uh, if it doesn't work with them, you're going to have a problem soon. But the, uh, the thing I was most driven by was working with the managers and taking care of the parks and taking care of submerged resources and parks, most of which they didn't know they had. Any other questions from the audience? Dan, do you have any uh, final thoughts? No, just thanks a lot for listening. And uh, appreciate your, your time. Great. Thank you so much, Dan, for your presentation this week. Uh, and uh, for all the other uh, showing us all these fantastic slides and, uh, and questions. Um, our next presentation will be on the 20th of October. Uh, MWAC uh, will present about Archaeoblitz that happened at Knife River Indian Villages. Um, thanks to our sponsors at Archaeology Southwest. And uh, we'll tune in next week. Please send me any feedback if uh, you have any other questions about um, future programming or uh, if you have any uh, suggestions about technical stuff. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.